Today is June 15th, 1989, yeah. and I'm sitting here with my grandmother, and she's going to fill everybody in on some family history. And, uh, let's start back with, with your grandparents, what you remember, and then your parents. Uh, my mother's mother, that could be my grandmother. All I remember of her is that her name was Hecker. Her married name was Hecker. Hecker, H-E-C-K-E-R. Huh. That's all I remember of her. Because hmm. I think when she passed away, I was little. My uh, father's mother and dad, uh, Kailiba was my grandmother's name, and Nushim was my grandfather's name, and that was my husband, no, that was my uh, father's parents. What, what does that translate into? What do you mean? Into English, what, uh, that was their Jewish name. Yeah, but their mean? name was Kaskowitz. Mm -hmm. uh, in the old country, the name was Kazakhovich, uh, which we were all born in Poland. Where, do you know where in Poland? Ostrava. Outside Warsaw? Uh, it was a small little shtetl, it means little town in Poland. Warsaw was a capital, and I don't know how far we were from Warsaw. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember very little of that. Uh, when, when, were, when were your parents born, do you know? I really have no idea of uh, that. You know, in the old country, way way back when, they really didn't have any birth certificates hmm. unless you were born in a big city, yeah. and uh, you didn't hardly even have. I don't even think they had doctors in a small town like that. So if you were delivered by a midwife or someone mm -hmm. that knew how to handle it. That's about all I know. Mm -hmm. And I came to this country with my mother in 19... I was seven years old. My father had already been in America a few years. Hmm. So you and just you and your mother lived so just, alone in Poland then? Yeah. And um, we came to this country. How did you come? You came. Uh, I don't even remember the yeah. name of the boat. Yeah. Uh, steerage, that, that yeah. much I know. And when we came to Ellis Island, uh, the man that entered us at Ellis Island could not spell Kazakhovich. So he got close enough like Kaskowitz. Hmm. And that was the name that uh, my father had used when he came to this country because his parents were Kaskowitz. Mm -hmm. And they came with him? No, they came before him, and then he came, and then he worked and saved his money and sent his passports, and then we came over. So I was seven years old when I came here. What did what what did he do when he came here? What did he do in Poland? What was his occupation? The the his the, the occupation not only of him but of his grandparents, of his mother and father. Mm -hmm. They were cap makers. 
caps oh like a hat yeah, yeah. yeah. and they they made uh, a lot of uh, caps for the army hmm. and that was the trade of the cat boys hmm. and um, we stayed with the uh, grandparents for a short while in New York right? yeah on the Lower East Side on Clinton Street mm -hmm. and um, my father's youngest brother was in high school then his name was Abraham A. we called him he was in high school and we came to this country on a weekend and it was a legal holiday President Wilson was inaugurated. Hmm. So we came to this country in 1912. Yeah. And um, when Monday came, my Uncle Abe said to my mother, I am taking her to school. What is her birthday? A, a, that conversation was in Jewish, mm -hmm. and she said she didn't really know, except in Jewish, it was three days before Rosh Hashanah. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any date to go by, so he took the calendar of that year, and he flipped to September, and he, when Rosh Hashanah came in that month, and he went one, two, Three, Counted three days before, days. and that was my birthday. So in English, my birthday was September four, nineteen oh five. No, oh four. Nineteen oh four. Yeah, nineteen oh four. And uh, my grandmother, Hilda, said, "Leave her alone." in Jewish, you know, that this was all in Jewish because they couldn't speak English very well. Uh, she'll be a teacher a year later, she just got here, let her get a little accustomed to this, no one taking her to school. And did you speak English then? You no, didn't I English didn't either. know a word of English. And I got, I went into the first grade because I was already seven years old. And I um, graduated public school. I graduated high school, but my parents were poor and they couldn't afford to send me to even business school. So my uncles, my father had four brothers and one sister. They were working in the millinery business mm -hmm. from cap makers from Europe. They ended up being hmm. in the millinery business. They, they worked and then uh, later on they went into business and one of my cousins also was in the millinery business so my father called him and asked him to take me in and teach me the trade yeah. and i became a millinery that was what i that's why you're a seamstress yes <laughs> well the seamstress yeah. came naturally yeah. because they were all uh, in the Europe, my family were all uh, workers uh, that required sewing, mm -hmm. you know, and I came by that naturally mm -hmm. because, you know, they were cap makers. They were all, and um, so he, he did my father a favor and took me in and taught me the millinery mm -hmm. business and taught me how to make hats and how to trim hats and everything and uh, I worked at that trade until I got married mm -hmm. and did, did your mother work too did she no, no. she was just the housewife what well, was my father uh, ended up owning a candy store mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know how <laughs> he, he went from that to uh, 
become a tailor because that was a natural thing for the fa for the fa background of the family, and he had a little store. We lived up upstairs, and he had a store downstairs, and uh, he was a tailor for secondhand clothes. He would buy old clothes and fix them, and then sell them down south. <laughs> People used to come from the south, you know, yeah. and buy the old clothes. And uh, that's a, that's all I really remember my father doing. He never did anything else. And your, um, your mother, what what was her maiden name? My mother's maiden name was Sorcha Hecker. Okay. And, uh, translated in English was Sarah. Sarah. Okay. And. Um, I don't know when they got married, but uh, until I came to America, to America, we lived in this small town of uh, Rostov. Then the next phase of my life is when I met my husband. His name was Morris Louis Bork. And his father, Isaac Bork, was a brother to my grandmother, Hylibe Kaskowitz. On your father's side. Yeah, on my father's side. So my husband was a cousin to my father. And he was my second cousin. A complete stranger to me. I had met Grandpa Isaac Borg, my father-in-law, a number of times, but it didn't register because I saw him just for a short time. Mm -hmm. And um, in 1926, My husband came to New York from Poland, from, from uh, Peoria, Illinois. Oh, okay. And um, he was staying at a hotel on forty around Forty Second Street. And he was coming to visit his uh, his aunt, Hyliba. Hmm. Uh, you know, and he was supposed to get on the subway and change at Canal Street for to take a train to go to Canarsie, that's somewhere in Brooklyn, New York. And he got messed up and he didn't know where to go, so he got off on Canal Street. He thought you had to get off the subway to take another one to go to. And he decided that as long as he was there, he would look around. He knew that he had uh, a cousin, and he knew his address. That would have been your father. That would have been my father, because he used to uh, write letters for his for his father to my father in English. See, and so. Uh, he got off on the land and, oh, he was supposed to get off on Canal Street, but got off on Delancey Street. That's where he made the mistake. So he decided to come and visit his cousin. And uh, I happened to be at that moment on Delancey Street. Yeah. And he, he walked up to me and he asked me if I knew where such an, an address on Division Street was. 
And uh, I said, yes, I know. And I did not uh, tell him I lived in that section. And uh, I started telling him where it was. And I said, well, there's no sense me telling you where it is because I'm going that way and I'll show you. <laughs> and he ended up at my home. That was the house he was looking for. Yeah, it was the house he was looking for. That's how I met him. <laughs> and so he uh, walked into my father's door and, and he told him who he was. And then my father invited him upstairs. And there we were. <laughs> and if you call up at the first sight, that's what it was. <laughs> And he uh, he never got to my grand to his aunt's house, which was my grandmother. Mm. And uh, he asked me for a date, and we start going with one another. And then he left shortly after that, and he said if I would write to him, he'd write to me or he'd call me because he wasn't much on writing. Would I? Mm -hmm accepted and I said sure so we had a courtship from uh, Peoria to New York by phone <laughs> and how long uh, and I was lucky enough to have a neighbor that lived upstairs that had a phone <laughs> so she would call <laughs> I didn't have to go out yeah. that way and the the courtship lasted until we got married Mm -hmm. I met him in 26, and we were married in um, uh, in June, June the 22nd of 1927. And right after the wedding, uh, well, we were to have a big wedding, but my grandfather, Milton, uh, Caskowitz uh, took very, very ill, and he did not expect them. We did not expect them to live. So uh, we got we canceled the wedding, and we had a bedside wedding. Mm. So he could he couldn't even talk, but he somehow managed after the ceremony to say Mazel Tov, and that was mm. the last thing he ever said. Mm. However, he lived for two years after that, but he was bedridden. Well, what was it, pneumonia? Or? I really don't know, you know, I really don't know. Old age, probably, a lot of other little things. How old do you think he was? I have no idea. You know, uh, the old timers from Europe would never tell you how old they were. Mm -hmm. It seemed to be a superstition. So you, you never got, you know, very far. They would only tell you little things, but not their age or anything. And uh, my husband had to leave right after the wedding. That's when uh, his uh, parents, Isaac and Fanny Bork, were in the scrap business. They had a scrapyard in Peoria. Already in Peoria. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's back up. Let's yeah. go back and, and and go from Grandpa Mike's family coming from Poland and then over here. And then, okay. Because they were in business. They had something before scrap no. business. Uh, okay. We'll go back to uh, Isaac and Fanny Bork. <laughs> They came, uh, he came to America, year, I can't tell you whether years or whatever, and uh, he came to his sister's house, Hyleva, which was my grandma, grandmother on my mm -hmm. father's side. And he stayed with them just a few days because First, they had a very small apartment. They just had three rooms, so they didn't have room for him. But he managed to stay a few days, and uh, 
he was very ambitious. He wanted to go to work right away, and his only thought was that he had a wife and two children, more, uh, more to lay, which is my husband, and Jeanette, the younger sister. And they were still in Poland. And they were still in Poland, and he wanted to bring them to America. And the only way he could bring them to America is if he went to work and saved his money. And you said he was a stone cutter? In and Poland? yes, in the old country, he was a stone cutter. And he came, when he came to this country, he looked around for work. He couldn't find it very much. So he got a job in a bakery shop. And not a bakery shop, a bakery where they make the breads and and rolls and whatever, you know. And um, he also asked him if he could sleep there because he didn't have any money and, you know, he couldn't stay with his sister. So uh, they let him sleep there in a little bake shop. And um, he worked for them for a short time he knew he could get very far that way, and he was wanted to, you know, really make a little more money. So he uh, could read Jewish and write, and he spoke several languages. <laughs> and he picked up a newspaper, which is still in existence now, the Forward, Forwards. Yeah. And it, um, there was an ad there. They wanted people to work. They were building the fair in St. Louis. Can't fill you in on the date, I don't know. And so he applied for the job and they shipped him to St. Louis. And he worked there building the fair until the work was done. And then when he got through, he couldn't afford to go back to New York. So he um, looked around, or I don't know how he got a job as a um, on, a, on, a, on a ship. Mm -hmm. On a barge or something? No, on a ship or a barge, I don't know, it's a ship, that's all I know. And he was shoveling coal into the ovens, mm -hmm. so a ship, you know, for steam. steam. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the ship was, I guess it's the Mississippi River, isn't mm -hmm. it, in St. Louis? Mm -hmm. And uh, they had uh, it was banked on the Mississippi River, and they had to wait until they got coal to put on the ship. So he was sitting on the shoreline, mm -hmm. stripped down just in shorts, because you know his job was a hot job, yeah. and black at the ace of spades. <laughs> And, and he was ready, too. Yeah, and he got a hold of a Jewish paper, and he was sitting on the bank of the Mississippi reading a Jewish paper. Hmm. And this Jewish man was walking. He was going to walk across the bridge to um, it's hard for me to remember all those things. To a, another across the Mississippi Bridge to a small town where farmers, a German colony, full of, you know, there was German people, they owned farms. And this man was walking and looking at this colored guy, mm -hmm. sitting and holding a Jewish paper, and he couldn't believe it because he was so dark, you know. Yeah. So he peeked over to see if he was, if he was holding the Jewish paper the right way. <laughs> and he saw that he had the Jewish paper in the right way. And my 
grand my father in law Isaac looked up and he said uh, or whether he said in English or in Jewish, I don't know. He said to him, "What? How come Schwartz is, is sitting on the banks of the Mississippi reading the Jewish paper?" And he says, "Because I'm not a Schwartz, I've been a Yid." <laughs> so he says, "What are you doing on here?" Because he was stripped down just in shorts. And he says, I'm just waiting for the cold to come so we can get it on this boat. And he says, that's where I work. I'm on, I work on the boat while putting coal into the, you know, the furnace. So the man says to him, what kind of a job is that for a kid? <laughs> so my uh, father in Isaac said, you know a better one? He says, sure. He says, I'm going to cross. The Mississippi on the other side, there's a lot of farms and mostly run by Germans. And he says, That's what I do summer. He says, And I work. He says, Can you make good money? He says, You sure can. He says, Do you think I can get a job? He says, I'm sure you can. So he says, Wait. And he got on the boat and he told the captain he was leaving. He wanted his money. So the captain paid him off. And all he had with him was a few clothes, a knapsack, you know, mm -hmm. put it across his shoulder and off he went. And he ended up working on the farms the whole summer. Mm -hmm. uh, when they'd get through whatever they were doing, thrashing or whatever, then go from one farm to the other. Mm -hmm. And at this time, Grandma Fanny was still in Poland. She yeah. Wasn't, she wasn't with him. Yet. No, she was still there. So he... Um, he, uh, the first day he worked for these, these German people, he was able, you know, to converse with them because he could talk the language. And uh, he went to work real, real, real early in the morning, and then uh, they'd come back uh, for lunch. And uh, they served meat and everything. He was very religious. So he didn't eat any of the meat. He ate an egg or bread or whatever, you know. And this woman was watching him. And she, she walked over to him, you know, the owner of it. And she said, uh, Herr Bork, he been stayed? And he said, yes. She says, you don't have to eat here. She says, I'll fix you your food. You'll eat at another table. And she, she knew, you know, what yeah. he could eat, so yeah. she would make him dairy meals. And then she passed the word along, because they went from one farm to the other until they were all through with the farming, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, she told them that he was a very good, good worker, and he was Jewish, and how to take care of him. So he thanked her very much, and then he went to look for his clothes because he wanted to wash a few things. He didn't have very much. And uh, she noticed it and she says, Herr Bork, what are you looking for? And he told her. And she says, it's all washed. It's on the line. You'll have it pretty soon. So when the season was over, he somehow or other got to Keokuk, Iowa because it was all in that territory and there was one Jewish family living there by the name of Schultz so we went to see him and they were in the scrap business junkyard and that's how he got into the business scrap business however uh, after he worked for these people for a while in the yard, uh, he had accumulated quite a bit of, well, to him it was a lot of money in those years, uh, because he didn't have to have pay for room and board, you know, so in meals he got when he worked on the farm. So he had saved up a little bit of money, but he needed a little more because he had to send for a wife and two children. And um, it seemed that this Schultz uh, gave him 
uh, besides working in the yard, he gave him a wagon and a horse to go to the farms and buy up whatever scrap they had or furs or anything. And uh, no matter how hard he worked, he didn't seem to be able to save a penny. Hmm. Well, because this Mr. Schultz, sorry to say, wasn't a very honest man. Hmm. And this was still before 1920. It was still in the teens. Yes, he. Uh, uh, he, he uh, uh, a gentleman, I don't remember his name, it, back there, still in this business, they were in the, uh, uh, they would buy all the fruit and the vegetables, the big company from farmers, and ship it, you know. And somehow or other they became friends. Now this man could not speak, uh, well he was of Italian. Hmm. And uh, my father-in-law couldn't speak very much English, mm -hmm. but somehow or other they were able to communicate. <laughs> and uh, he happened to mention, he says, how come, he says, you're with, still working with Schultz, why don't you try and get another job? He's a crook. Yeah. And my father-in-law knew that. Yeah. And he says, what can I do? He said, I'll tell you what you can do. He says, I will give you a horse and wagon. I will not charge you anything for it. Mm -hmm. And he says, I will load you up with fruits and vegetables. And you go the same route to the farmer, you know, the mm -hmm. farm and everything, and in the city, and start so. selling that. Mm -hmm. He says, I'll Give, tell you the prices, give you a scale and everything, and he says, I guarantee you that when you're through for the day, you'll be making hmm. quite a bit of money. And this man was growing all these on his farm? No, he was in, uh, he was he was buying from the farmers mm -hmm. and selling it so. to the groceries and shipping it. You know, it was a big company. They're still in, in business, you know. And uh, that was his real start. He was fortunate. He was the type of a man that uh, everyone liked, mm -hmm. and he was very, very honest. And people were willing to help. Mm -hmm. So after he had worked for him for quite a while, this gentleman said to him, there was a store vacant on Main Street. In Keokuk. Back in Keokuk, Iowa. He says, I will help you. Uh, I, they, I think besides selling all the produce, they also were in the uh, fruit, uh, the can, uh, canning uh, mm -hmm. for groceries, you know what I mean. And he, um, he says, I will load up your store with everything besides uh, vegetables and everything, you go in the grocery business. Mm -hmm. And he says, we will help you. He mm -hmm. says, well, I don't have, you know, too much money. He says, you don't have to pay me. When you make the money, every month you'll give me so much, you know. Yeah. Wonderful people. Yeah. And that's how we started in the grocery business. And upstairs, there was a couple of rooms. And downstairs, there was a little kitchen. You know, not much, but it was a start for them. And uh, when he started, before he started in that grocery business, he already had accumulated enough money to send the passports to his wife mm -hmm. and his two children. And they came to Keokuk, Iowa. Mm -hmm. They came, so they came through Ellis Island then, and uh, I, how did yeah. they get across, you know? I mean, how did they get from Ellis Island to Keokuk? I don't, I really don't know. We never discussed it. Evidently, uh, uh, his, uh, his sister, they must have come from Ellis Island to New York. Mm -hmm. And probably his uh, 
sister and the brother-in-law may have, that I'm just guessing, yeah. may have picked them up. And somehow, I don't know how, whether he went to New York for them or they went on their own. I don't know how they got there. I think there. he had a car or they came by train? No. I, oh, it had to be train. Yeah. There's no planes in those yeah. uh, days, you know. It had to be. How they got to Keokuk, I can, yeah. really can't tell you. And Grandma Fanny, her family was still then in Poland. Her uh, well, uh, well, Grandma Fanny's family, she did not have much of a family because her, uh, her uh, father had died when she was young. Mm -hmm. What was their name? You know? I don't know her maiden name. Hmm. And um, she was uh, and considered an orphan because she didn't have a father. So uh, in Europe, uh, people are in sympathy with such families. Somehow or other, she met, she was 16 years old when she met Isaac, her husband Isaac Bork. And he was 29. Wow, that's quite an age difference then. And uh, they were married. Hmm. And she had, when she was 17, she had Morris Louis Bork, which is my husband. And um, they came to America, like I say, I don't know uh, how they got to Keokuk, and he tried to teach her, even though she couldn't speak English, how to sell in the grocery store. So she was probably less than 20 then. Yeah. Under 20 when she came. And uh, my husband was five years old and came to this country and his sister was 18 months no couldn't be five because there was three years difference in their age she was 18 months yeah. Jeanette. Yeah, yeah. so he probably would have been three and a half or yeah, four something maybe. like that yeah and uh, eventually he taught her how to sell the groceries because they were all marked and everything. Mm -hmm. And he was still going out with vegetables on a have you and trying to sell. Uh, that particular following year uh, was a very bad year for the farmers. And there would have been uh, a shortage, like potatoes and things like that, you know, that they grew there. And so this friend uh, who had put him into that business said to him, um, you have a, a, a big basement downstairs with, with a floor that was uh, dirt, you know, that kind. And he says, there's going to be a shortage of potatoes. Hmm. He says, I am going to load you up with a hundred pound bags of potatoes, I will fill it up there, and you will make a good profit on it come this winter. <laughs> and for no reason, just because he liked him. For no, no reason whatsoever, except that he befriended him and he mm -hmm. liked him very well. <laughs> and uh, that's what he did. And that year, there was a shortage. And he would sell these hundred pound bags at a terrific profit and he made quite a bit of money. And things were going pretty good for them. Uh, as the children got older, they had no contact with our Jewish people and our Jewish religion. Hmm. And um, it was still just the two of them? Uh, there was the two of them, and she had, I think they were born in Keokuk, and she had uh, uh, another son. Who was born in Keokuk? Uh, Charlie. 
Okay, so Charlie was Charlie Bork and um, then Uncle Sam. And Sam. And then Aunt Frida. Frida was born in Peoria. So yeah. And so um, Grandpa, uh, my father-in-law Isaac, was very religious, so was she, and they were pretty strict with the children growing up. They had no contact with Jewish friends or anything, and he wouldn't permit them to go with anybody. So they were pretty lonesome. Mm -hmm. And um, he had another good friend, but he had a, uh, he had a lot of friends in Cape Cook, the judge of that town was very friendly with him. He had learned how to speak English, mm -hmm. a kind of broken English, but he was able to converse. And um, then there was a, uh, it was a big Swedish uh, con uh, people, a lot of Swedish people living in Keokuk. And this one man that he befriended, uh, that befriended him, he met these people at the corner at the drugstore yeah. where they would meet and in the evening for pastime they would play whist. Yeah. My father in law is very good at cards. Oh it was a card game. Yeah. Whist is a card game. It's the beginning of bridge. Huh. Whist is the beginning of learning how to play bridge. Yeah. And um my husband Mike, well, I better call him Morris. I'll, I'll get to that point and tell you how he got that nickname. He uh, would go with his father and he would sit there and he'd watch him play the cards. And um, this Swedish man, friend of his, uh, said to him one day, I says, you're not being very fair to your children. He says, I've watched it. There is a boy, 14, 15 years old, sitting here and watching you play cards, and he's learning. You don't let them date any Gentile girls in school, you know. He says, this is no life for you to raise children. There are no Jews here. There's no synagogue. There's nothing. There's no kosher grocery. There's nothing. They'd have to go out of town to get kosher meat. And they kept kosher too. Didn't yeah, they? mother they did. Know. Yeah. And uh, she kept kosher all her life. Mm -hmm. And so he says, what can I do? He says, I've got my livelihood here. Mm -hmm. he says, what, what was it like his like? 30s then or something? I have no conception of age really. Because well, if they were married at 29. He was married at 29, so he was oh, in the yeah, late, late 30s. 30s, close to 40. Anyhow, he says, I'll tell you what you do. He says, I go, this man worked on the construction of roads and highways and all that. And he says, I go into Peoria, we're building roads leading to there. He says, there's a, a Swedish community there, and I've got friends, a lot of friends, and I spend my weekends, you know, there. And he says, I looked around, he says, they have a Jewish synagogue, they have a temple, they have over 400 Jewish families there. And the town is Peoria, the city of Peoria. He says, it is, I think that's where you should be with your family. Well, my father-in-law Isaac was a doer, hard worker and a doer. By that time he had a car, he owned a car. That weekend he got into the car and he went to Peoria, Illinois. And what about he had a he had a push cart or something or a, the horse too? Did he take that? No, he took nothing. He just got in his automobile, yeah. and he went to Peoria, and he went right to the Jewish synagogue, yeah. and talked to the rabbi, looked the town over, and he decided that is where he belongs with yeah. his family. 
he, they were at that, he, at, he couldn't go into the grocery business. He looked around before he left, you know, stayed there a few days. There was two spec dealers in Peoria. Keller's, which was big, and Snafsky, which wasn't much. And he decided they were going into the scrap business. Hmm. He looked around to see where he could find a spot and a place. Uh, hmm. He bought the ground because he had accumulated quite a lot of money. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was something like $10,000 or $11,000. A lot of ground. Yeah, and a lot of money then too. Yeah, right? and uh, it had a brick house yes. on the corner, which was in a very good condition, but the lower part could be used as an office, and the upstairs they could make bedrooms. And I think at the lower part they had a sort of, well, it wasn't a kitchen, which you could convert in a kitchen because it had uh, a sink. Mm -hmm and um, a little stove, I don't know what, you know. And he called her up and he says, Fanny, sell the business. I am not coming back. <laughs> sell the business, sell all the groceries, sell everything. And get I don't know whether he had another car, but he said, I'm not coming back. And he told her what he did, and she was just hysterical. She cried. She liked the idea. Of she was afraid because it was quite a terrific change for their, you know, for them. Uh, and uh, he said, I'm not coming back. <laughs> so I think they came by train. No, they didn't have another car. They came by yeah. train. And they, that's, they did what he told them to do. And they came in 1921 to Peoria. Yeah. There was four kids then before him. Well, I think, wait a minute, I think the youngest, Frida, I think she was also born in Keokuk. It came with five kids. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> she came and she looked at the, at the yard with nothing in it. <laughs> All that he was able to do was put up a fence. And she looked at this dilapidated home. <laughs> and all she could do was cry. Hmm. But there they were, they started, and they did whatever they could to sort of fix up the place a little bit, put a stove in, and the kitchen was sort of like a kitchen, a sink and a stove, and upstairs a few rooms, you know, they cleaned it up and everything, and he started buying scrap. Hmm. He started in the business. What, just going around? No, up, no, I think what I think as much as I know about it, I never heard too much about it. I think he advertised mm -hmm. and people, you know, uh, that had a lot of scrap because after all, there was a lot of farms mm -hmm. and everything and there was big industry in Peoria mm -hmm. and they brought their scrap in. They also bought uh, uh, old rags, old clothes, you mm -hmm. know, and all that. And that's how it got started at Peoria, and he did very, very well. Hmm. He was a man that everyone liked. He was very honest. He was very charitable. He was very kind. Hmm. And he had that certain something that people would confide in him. Hmm. He also had a, a good heart, and he was very 
charitable. He would do, you know, in this time that he spent in Peoria, he would he helped a lot of people, and he believed that if you did something good for people, you would help them. You never talked about it. Mm -hmm. If they, if you loaned them money and they could pay it back, fine. And if they didn't, it didn't bother him. Mm -hmm. That was the type of a man he was. And um, he joined the synagogue. The children, you know, went to school. They went Sunday to Hebrew school. And uh, what can I tell you? He, he uh, had a very, he left a very, very good name in Peoria. And he tried to raise his children the same way. And I'm very happy to say that my husband took after him mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. He, he was raised well. And uh, then when I met him in, in uh, 26, and we came back to Peoria. He was in the scrap business. Mm -hmm. Now I have to go back uh, somewhat. When uh, World War I broke out, my husband, Morris, who was born, enlisted in the Army at the age of 16. Mm -hmm. He, uh, I think he was still living in Keokuk then. He lied about his age. He said he was 18. He was a, uh, and it'd be a big guy, you know. He, he was slim, but he was tall and everything, and somehow got into the army. So he was in the first World War One. He served across in Europe. And when he came back, in fact, his parents didn't know where he was. He did not tell them for a couple of years until someone befriended him in the army and straightened him out and made him call home. Uh, then we'll go back to when I met him and got married and came to Peoria. Being he was gone that time, you know, he enlisted in Peoria. Uh, and he came back, he didn't want to be in the scrap business. He did something else for a while, nothing turned out right. So um, his uh, father and mother decided that they'd had enough of it, and that the children weren't going to go into the business and everything, they didn't see no reason for them to work. Mm -hmm. So they sold the business hmm. to Mansfield. And um, every time my father-in-law Isaac would go there, he had to pay him every month. He'd sort of cry on his shoulders. He wasn't making any money and this and that and all that sort of thing. Well, by that time, my husband was already back. and. Uh, he didn't know what to do, so he um, went to Howard's and uh, they gave him a truck and he went from garage to garage picking up scrap and selling it to Hellas because his father was out of the business already. And then he started up a small place in the 14th, small junkyard in the 1400 block, South Adams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, my father-in-law watched him and he saw how he was doing and he was interested. And of course he had to be because we were married. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you were married? Yeah. Already. Okay. So um, one day he comes in to him and he said to the son, how would you like to go into business with me? And he says, why? 
He says, well, Mansfield's having problems. And he says, uh, I made him a deal. I'm buying it back. You want to be my partner? So he says, sure. So grandpa, my father-in-law went out in the yard. This pile was worth so much. This pile was worth so much. This pile was and all that. And he said, we'll close this place up. We'll sell all the stuff because it wouldn't pay to take it from one place to the other. It was too much trouble. And it came out after being about a year in business with $17,000 profit. Wow. And that was how it became I Bork and Sons. And um, they, he, he uh, went into business with his father, and that's how I Bork and Sons started. And my father in law didn't do very much. He would just come down, pick up the Jewish newspaper, sort of look around, give advice, and this and that. And go home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's how this started. Uh, a year later, I had my daughter. Three years, about three years later, I had my son, my daughter, Brianna, my son, Norman which is your father. Mm -hmm. And uh, about three years, what was that, 1927? So Norm, uh, Brian was born in 1928. Uh, Norman was born in 1931. And then in 1935, I had another son. And that was my family. Mm -hmm. I lived with Mother Bork for six and a half years in her home. They were wonderful parents to me. Mm -hmm. And then when I got pregnant with my third child, it would be moved to our own home. We bought a home. 110 South Eleanor Place. Business was going along very well. My husband made quite a big success of his business. And uh, we had a very happy life together. Became my children got married. My first daughter passed away at the age of 18. She graduated from high school. Her name was Bryna, also called Bryna in English. Two boys graduated high school. They went to college, both of them, for a couple of years. They did not graduate. And they ended up in the scrap business. So actually, it was I, Bork, and Sons and Sons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Did Uncle Sam and Uncle Charlie ever go into this? Uh, no, Uncle Sam was, Uncle Charlie and Uncle Sam weren't as uh, much as I say. They didn't care. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to be in the business. They didn't know what they wanted to do, you know. We didn't think they'd ever amount to very much. However, they, they, yeah, they did all right. They did all right. Uh, uh, Charlie, you know, was in this service and uh, he was stationed in um, somewhere in California mm -hmm. and he remained there. Mm -hmm. And how, how old was, was 
Grandpa Isaac when he quit the scrap business? Did he did he finally pull out of it, or did uh, he, just... he 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 kept well, he kept his fingers mm -hmm. into the business, but he wasn't too active. Mm -hmm. He uh, was getting this good salary to live on, you know. Mm -hmm. The business was very, very successful with my, he sort of, after he saw what my husband could do, he just left it all to him. Mm -hmm. He'd go down, look it over, and then go back home, you know. He was, he was sort of, you could say, semi-retired. But he wasn't very old, was he? Uh, no, he was, um, I think he was about 60, no, he was 63 when he passed away. Hmm. And, uh, Mike took care of his mother mm -hmm. very, very well. She still had an income coming from the business, you know. They considered they considered her still part of the business. But she worked there with him too, yeah. She worked there with him too. And <clears throat> my husband uh, then, you know, being he was in the First World War,